We're in part two of a mini-series called Free from Lake Sawyer Church, friends of mine. And today we have Pastor Tracy. And in this series, we're really unpacking uh, what it means to find freedom in Jesus. Because the, the reality is what Jesus has done for us on the cross doesn't just have implications for our eternity. It has implications for our lives here today. Jesus wants to set us free. And so we're going to talk about six steps to finding freedom. This morning is step one of those six steps. So we're going to get into that. But first, I'd like to pray. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for the sunshine that we've had these past several days. Uh, we pray that uh, this morning that you would be here, that you would speak to us. We're here to, uh, to hear from you. So would you draw us closer to you this morning? Uh, we love you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So a while back, I was serving at, uh, at a church out in the peninsula in the Silverdale area, if you know where that is, and I was the youth pastor over there. My family's from here. This is where I, where I grew up. And so we did this drive a lot, where you're driving from the Kitsap Peninsula over to this area, to Black Diamond, and that drive includes the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And there's a spot right before the bridge starts that a carpool lane starts. It's just a regular road, then there's a carpool lane. And on this fateful day, I was driving on the road and carpool lane started, so I pulled into the carpool lane. And the car behind me also got in the carpool lane, and this guy's driving like way too close to me behind me. And I know that it's a he because I can clearly see him in my rearview mirror. That's how close he is to me. And I'm getting kind of upset because it's not like I'm going slow. I'm going a healthy nine miles an hour over the speed limit. You know, fast enough to get where I'm going, but not so fast that I'm maybe going to get pulled over. I'm sure a cop in this room would be like, no, I'll get you. I'll get you for nine. But I was going about nine miles an hour over the speed limit, so I'm getting upset at the car behind me. He's really close to me, and I can see this person in my rearview mirror, and I noticed he's alone. He, there's no one in the car with him, and we are in the carpool lane, and so there I am, and now I'm upset. I'm driving in the carpool lane. You're tailgating me while I'm speeding, and you're not even supposed to be in this lane, and so you know what I did? I slowed down. I started driving the speed limit. Like, you know what? You're not going to cheat the system and get where you're going faster by getting in the carpool lane when you're not even supposed to be in this lane. So I slowed down, started going the speed limit, and he ended up getting the other lane and zooming past me, and it was all good. But I felt pretty good about myself in, <laughs> in that moment. And it happened about a minute later. It was weird. Like, all of a sudden, my eyes were open to this fact. I realized something. I was alone in my car that whole time. So there I was, completely unaware of what was really happening in my little world, in my car, and I was judging someone behind me for doing the exact same thing that I was doing. Now that was my wife's car, and it was also the family car. I had one kid at the time, and so if, if uh, I was in this car, like my family was with me. And if I was doing that drive from the peninsula to this area, I was probably visiting family. We were probably all together. It was really rare for me to be in that car and to be alone. So out of habit, I just got in the carpool lane and I completely didn't realize that I was breaking into law too. But there I was like unaware of my situation and judging someone else for doing the same exact thing that I was doing. The reality is I'm not as self-aware as I'd like to think that I am. And I think that isn't just true of me. It's true of people in general. I mean, as you meet people, as you get to know people, you realize that they don't realize certain things about themselves. They're not really self-aware about this or that. You might know someone who is a close talker. You know, they get like uncomfortably close to you while they're, while they're talking and they don't even realize that they're doing it. And maybe you're that person and you don't realize that you're doing it. You, you might know people who are double dippers. You know, they double dip their chips at a party and they don't realize that that's not cool to do that. Now, both of those are actually Seinfeld episodes, the close talker and the, and the double dipper. But the point is that human beings, we're just not always very self-aware about stuff going on in our lives, about our blind spots. But what I want to talk about this morning is how aware you are when it comes to your faith. When it comes to your spiritual blind spots, do you have any spiritual blind spots? Are you aware of the things that God wants to do in your life? It's really easy sometimes to point these things out in other people, but it's difficult to see it in ourselves. But on this journey to finding freedom, step one is awareness. Step one is 
awareness to finding freedom because we need to really see what's going on in our hearts and in our minds. We need to be able to be honest about our own mess before we can become free people and experience the freedom that God wants to give us. You know, we live in a, in a culture, in a world, it's really a fast-paced, noisy, busy world. If you go and ask anybody how they're doing, you'll often hear them say this, you know, I'm good, but I'm busy. You ever said that before? I'm doing good, but I'm just really busy. I say that all the time. Sometimes I'll say it, and then I'll think about my day, and I think, I really got nothing going on today, but I, just, I feel busy. I feel this, this hurried life kind of pushed on to me. It's a little bit of a, of a cultural thing. Busyness in our culture is kind of a badge of honor. If I'm more busy than you, I'm probably more important than you. I feel important when I'm busy. And when I'm not busy, I feel like I, I should be busy. Why aren't you busy? You should be filling your life with so many things. It's kind of an adrenaline rush to be busy. I was uh, at home a few nights ago, and my son, who's two, was playing next to my daughter, who's four. They're kind of not doing the same thing, but they're next to each other. And my daughter said, hey, buddy, why don't you come do this with me? And he said, no, I'm too busy. He learned that from someone, right? He learned, and he's learning, he's watching me, learning how to be a man, and he's learning that being too busy for other people is a little bit of, of how it goes. It was hard for me to hear that when my, my son said that. He's two years old. No, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy. But for a lot of us, our days are filled with deadlines. It's filled with stuff. And if you're like me, there aren't very many spare seconds. And when you do get a spare second, you end up doing something with it. You, you take your phone out and you're doing this. You turn on Netflix. Our spare seconds are instantly consumed. There's, there's a pastor from Portland. His name is John Mark Comer. He wrote a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it's a great book. If you're someone who reads, I'd encourage you to read that book. It's a quick read. Um, if you're someone who doesn't read, you should become someone who reads and you should read that book. But in this book, he has a chapter where he kind of unpacks the history of the speed of life. Because the reality is the speed of life in our culture today is something that humans haven't really experienced before. And on that timeline, one, one of the biggest dates was in 1879, something happened. The light bulb was invented. Before the light bulb, when the sun went down, people just went to bed. You know, they might have burned a candle for a little while, but you can't do that all night long. And so you basically rose and went to bed with the sun. But when the light bulb was invented, you could stay up later. You know how many hours of sleep the average person got before the light bulb was invented? 11 hours a night. Doesn't that sound nice? Today it's more like seven, but if you talk to any high schooler today, you'd be like, hey, when did you go to bed last night? 4 a.m., like that, that's what they'll say. Of course, they sleep in until noon, so maybe it's about the same. But we used to get a lot more sleep. These days we're awake for more hours, but those hours are filled with stuff. Another date on that timeline that was a big date was in 2007. You know what happened in 2007? The smartphone was invented. The first iPhone was released in 2007. And you can debate, like, is this a good thing for the world? Is this a bad thing for the world? There's a lot to say about smartphones and the iPhone. But for our purposes, what happened when that was invented was it became very easy for us to distract ourselves. It's really easy to be distracted. And we basically live in a constant state of distraction. Do you remember the historical pastime of being bored? Like that used to be a thing, right? If you were early to something, you just sat there and like, like waited. What I do now if I'm waiting at the doctor's office, my phone is out and I'm, I'm doing this. If I ever have a spare second, it, get, it gets consumed instantly. Something grabs my attention. If my attention is available, something grabs it. And in a world where our attention is one of the hottest commodities, awareness is a problem. For a lot of people today, awareness is difficult. And in that book, uh, John Mark Comer makes the claim that hurry, hurry is the greatest threat to our spiritual lives today. If I asked you, what's, what's the biggest threat to our spiritual lives? You might say some political things. You might say some ideological things. You might not mention the busyness of life, the hurry that our culture has. But here's why he says that. Our speed of life keeps us from hearing the voice of God. Our speed of life, it keeps us from hearing the voice of God. And in our hurried lives, it prevents us from truly looking at what's going on in our hearts, from truly asking the question, God, what is it that you're trying to do? What are some things I haven't dealt with yet? 
And for some of us, this is actually intentional. We stay busy because we don't actually want to open that box and see what's inside. We, we stay busy because we don't want to deal with our loneliness. We don't want to deal with some of our past wounds. We don't want to deal with some of the junk that's going on inside. And, and so we stay busy on purpose. But if we're going to find freedom, it needs to start with this. It needs to start with awareness. Awareness and hurry, they have a relationship. As hurry decreases, our awareness increases. What I want to do this morning is look at two things from the life of Jesus. Because Jesus, uh, our, when we put our, our faith and trust in Jesus, it's not just a belief in him, but we're taking on his lifestyle as well. Jesus had a way of life that actually invites awareness and fights hurry. And I think it's something that our world could use today. And so I want to look at two things from the life of Jesus, the pace of Jesus and the presence of Jesus. So we're going to look at Point number one, first, the pace of Jesus. He, uh, Jesus was a busy guy. He seemed to always have a lot going on. He's jumping from point A to point B. People are always around him. They want something from him. And even with that, Jesus' life had this pace to it. He had this rhythm to it where he would serve and then he would withdraw. And he would serve and then he would withdraw. And we see that in Luke chapter five, starting in verse 15 and also reading 16. It says, yet the news about him that's Jesus. The news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And so everyone wants a piece of Jesus. Huge crowds are surrounding him. They want something from him. They want to hear his teaching. They want to be healed of their sicknesses. He was a busy guy, but he prioritized. He made time to go and be alone to be alone with his father, to be alone and pray, to be alone and rest and reflect. It said that Jesus often, not like once in a while, but he often withdrew to lonely places. He was in the quiet place, in this silent solitude. And really that's where God often speaks, is in that quiet place, in, this, in the solitude, in the stillness. There's a great story in 1 Kings 19, where God is speaking to the prophet Elijah, and he says, hey, Elijah, go on this mountain, and I'm going to show up. So Elijah goes to the mountain, and when he's there, there's this huge windstorm that happens, and like it's so, it's so huge that these rocks are cracking and breaking, and he's thinking, okay, this must be God showing up. But then it says God wasn't in the windstorm. And after that, this earthquake came, and if you're Elijah, you're like, yes, God's showing up. And this earthquake happened on the mountain, which is probably a scary place to be when an earthquake is happening. But it said God wasn't in the earthquake. And then this fire surrounded the mountain. And if you're Elijah, you're thinking, I've heard of the burning bush before. This must be God showing up. But God wasn't in the fire. And it says after the fire, there was this still, gentle, quiet whisper. And God spoke to Elijah in this gentle, quiet whisper. The reality is God often speaks to us in a quiet voice. But I wonder how many of us, we're, we're missing what God is saying, what God wants to say to us, because we, we drown him out with noise and distraction. Jesus had this pace of life where he did ministry, he, he worked hard, but then he'd withdraw, and he'd reflect, and he'd rest, and he'd, he'd pray. And that rhythm is something God actually established for his people, the Israelites in the Old Testament. It's called Sabbath. He, he instituted, he commanded that you take a break one day a week just for this, to enjoy God, to rest, to reflect, and to pray. In Exodus 20, 8 through 10, this is God telling the Israelites, you need to do this once a week. You need to take a Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath, it says. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And this isn't just for the Jewish people in the Old Testament. This is for Christians today. For it to be a regular part of our rhythm to slow down, to stop, to reflect, to pray, and to rest. The reality is that practicing the Sabbath, it isn't like something God makes us do to make life difficult so we have one less day to do stuff. It's a gift from God that's for our good. To to stop and to reflect. This was the pace of life that, that Jesus had. Now, the, the speed of life that we're living in, it keeps us from being aware of our spiritual blind spots. I wonder how many of us, if we stopped and slowed down, we maybe would, would hear something or, or we would become aware of something that we, we didn't even realize. You might realize you're driving in a carpool lane and there's no one in the car with you. 
But what if our lives were aligned with the pace of Jesus? I think our, our sense of hurry would decrease. And I think our awareness would, would increase. But what would that look like for you? Maybe, maybe that means waking up earlier. I know we don't get a lot of sleep, but if we wake up a little bit earlier and devote some time to, to doing just that, asking God some of those questions, spending time with Jesus. Or for some of you, it might be not waking up earlier, but using the end of your day differently instead of just kind of binging Netflix until you fall asleep. Again, just constantly being distracted. This is what I often do. What if you use that time to do this? You use that time at the end of your day to reflect on your day, to spend time with God, to ask some of those questions. God, where are my spiritual blind spots? Or it could be starting a new habit in your life. Where are those moments throughout the day when you can do this? Maybe while you're driving, instead of just turning on the radio or listening to a podcast. Again, these distractions that we constantly distract ourselves with. What if we use that, that drive to be alone, to be alone with God, to sit in the, in the quiet place? What would it look like for you to practice the pace of Jesus? Now let's talk about the, the presence of Jesus. Now everyone wanted a piece of Jesus. Everywhere he went, there were people all, all over the place. I imagine it's kind of like the, the paparazzi with celebrities, right? They get out of their car and there's just a crowd of people around them. Jesus in this story in Mark chapter 5, he had just gotten out of a boat and instantly there's like this crowd around him instantly. And, and Jesus was always busy. He always had people around him. He always had people wanting to be healed. They wanted to see his power. They wanted to heal his, hear his, his teaching. His, his enemies were always there. They wanted to trap him in his words. They wanted him to say the wrong thing. And with all of that, as he's going from thing to thing to thing, Jesus had this amazing way of being present in the moment. He was always available. He was very interruptible. And he was interrupted all the time, but he, he welcomed it. And he acknowledged the person, even while he's very busy. So in Mark chapter 5, like I said, he gets out of this boat, and there's instantly crowds around him. And a man in the crowd pushes his way to the front, and he tells Jesus, my daughter is dying. Come to my house. You can heal her. Now, this is already an interruption. Jesus and his disciples are doing things, and somebody says, hey, stop what you're doing and come with me to my house. I have something important I want you to do. Obviously, his, his daughter is dying. This is a pretty critical thing. And Jesus, he doesn't say, hey, take a number. He doesn't say, I'll get back to you. He just says, yeah, let's go. And so they start walking to this man's house, and while he's on his way, again, the crowds are everywhere around him. It says there's a woman in the crowd who had experienced some terrible medical issues, where she had experienced bleeding for 12 years years. And she knew if I can get to Jesus, if I can touch him, I'll be healed. And so she gets to Jesus and she touches his clothes and it says instantly she was healed. And here's what happens in Mark 5, starting in verse 30. It says, at once Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had, hap what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So this was another interruption. He was on his way to heal a little girl from dying, and someone touches his clothes and is healed, and Jesus stops and asks the question, hey, who touched me? And his disciples are like, what? Like, there are people everywhere. There are, there are two people all over touching you. How can you ask who touched me? And he doesn't move on. Jesus waits. Waits for someone to kind of own up to it. Someone touched me. Who touched me? And I'm sure if you're the man whose daughter is dying, you're like, hey, Jesus, remember, we're, we're on our way. We're, we're doing something. And Jesus, he waits until this woman comes forward and, and tells him the, the whole truth. And Jesus used that moment to acknowledge her, to bless her, and to encourage her. He wasn't too busy for the moment. He was incredibly present. He acknowledged this, this woman. And I'm sure if you're the, uh, the man's daughter, you're thinking, okay, let's go. We got we to gotta go. But Jesus was incredibly present in the moment. I think about my life. A few years back, again, when I was at this church over on the peninsula, I was new to the area. I didn't know too many people. And I had a, a day where I had an errand to do. I went to Target. And when my wife goes to Target, it's like an all-day thing. 
But for me, this is gonna be like a quick in and out. I got one thing to do. It's gonna be maybe five minutes. And so I'm at Target and I walk in and out of my peripheral vision, I kind of see someone who's looking my direction and kind of walking toward me. Of course, I'm entering the store and it seemed like she was, was about to be leaving the store. And I keep walking and I hear her say, Pastor Weaver, Pastor Weaver. Now, my last name does start with a W, but it's not Weaver, it's Walsh. And so technically, I'm not Pastor Weaver. And so I just, I keep walking. And I'm thinking, like, I got a lead on her. If I walk quickly, I can probably, I could probably lose her in the store. But she chased me down and caught up with me and just wanted to say hi. She went to my church. And I just, I didn't want to be interrupted in that moment. I wanted to get in and get out. I was doing something. I wasn't very interruptible. In fact, she said, hey, Pastor Weaver, I was calling your name. And I said, oh, that's, that's not my name. My last name's Walsh. And she said, oh, so you did hear me. <laughs> and I had to apologize. That, I just, I didn't want to have this conversation. It looks, it looks silly now, looking back. I didn't want to have this conversation with a human. And I ended up having a much more awkward conversation after the fact. I wasn't very present in the moment. I wanted to get in and get out. But that's not who Jesus is. He was very interruptible. Jesus was always available. How interruptible are you? Are you available? Are you present in the moment? Sometimes when I'm at home, that's when I'm least present. When I'm sitting there in front of my, my wife and kids are right in front of me, they're the most important thing in my life, the best thing in my life apart from Jesus, and I tend to be mentally somewhere else. It's hard to be present. You know, we're busy, we're hurried, we're distracted. And the way distraction works, it works against our relationships, our relationships with other people, our relationship with God. When we're constantly distracted, we have an awareness problem. Our awareness problem really is a presence problem. We're not present in the moment. We're distracted. We're busy. We're driving in the carpool lane, and we don't even realize that we're alone in the car. And so with all of this, what we're really talking about is slowing down. Slowing down in our, in our lives so that we can be more aware of what God's trying to do in you and through you. Now with the pace of Jesus, we're talking about building a rhythm of slowing down. And then with the presence of Jesus, it's about literally slowing down so you can acknowledge the person that's right next to you or right in front of you. The way of Jesus, it, it fights hurry and it invites awareness. I think that a lot of us, we, God wants to do something in your life, but sometimes we aren't always wanting what God wants for us. We're like, yeah, God, I'm stoked about eternity with you. I'm stoked about heaven, but I don't really want you to have access to this piece of my life. And what God wants to do is to really give you freedom in this life today, but sometimes we don't really want to go there. But what we're talking about when we're talking about slowing down is, is being honest with God and asking those tough questions. God, is there something in my life that I haven't dealt with yet? Is there something in my life that you want to do? Is there, do I have any spiritual blind spots? And those questions remind, remind me of one of the Psalms, Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. The reality is that Jesus sets us free. He sets us free from sin and death. He sets us free from the law. We don't have to be good enough for God. We are free. But he also sets us free from our brokenness. Jesus sets us free from some of our wounds and some of our pain. But I wonder how many Christians, we aren't experiencing that freedom. And that all starts with Awareness. It starts with asking those questions. God, where are my spiritual blind spots? Where am I not really keeping, where I'm keeping you at bay and not letting you have access to these parts of my life? Now, if we start to ask those questions, it's the first step toward freedom. We have a lot more to say on this discussion for the next several weeks, but step one is simply that. What would it look like in your life to slow down, to align your life with the pace of Jesus and the, the presence of Jesus, that maybe you'd have some more awareness of what God wants to do, of, of your spiritual blind spots. How could you stop and ask those questions? God, where is it that I'm not letting you have access to my life? Where's the spiritual brokenness in me that I've been avoiding? Those are the first steps toward finding freedom. Let's pray.
Father God, thank you that you're a God who doesn't just want us with you for eternity in heaven. You actually have new life and freedom for us in this life. I pray that you give us a desire to, uh, to seek out the things that you want for us. Show us the ways that we're not aware. Show us the, the ways that you want to set us free. Any areas we're withholding from you, God, would you give us clarity? And I pray that you give us the boldness, not just to, to ask the question, but then to respond, to step into freedom. We know that you have great things for us. Would you give us the, the courage to step into that, God? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.